Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk today about um, best skin through the decade or how and why skin ages and what can we do to prevent it. Uh, my name is Gilly Munavale. I'm a dermatologist in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I just want to thank uh, Joe, of course, and uh, for organizing this awesome meeting and for having me back again for, I believe this is about the eighth time. So uh, thank you. And uh, we're going to continue on. So what do we know about aging? Well, it begins at obviously the day we're born and it's highly individualized. So there's really no single measure of how old somebody is. It pre aging proceeds at different rates and different people. Um, facial aging is a normal biologic process. The difference uh, really exists based on gender, geography, occupational or, or, and environmental exposures, disease, and obviously maintenance or upkeep. Uh, the ability to, to alter facial aging, both bio biochemically, surgically, and genetically, is actually in the here and now. And we can improve in our function and alter our human experience uh, through procedures that are currently available, and there's a lot of exciting things to come. So we know with the skin during aging, uh, it goes in characteristic changes. There's reduction in collagen, the skin gets thinner, it gets drier, we lose more water, so hydration is a key, and it becomes less elastic. In other words, there's decreased elastic fiber, so the skin becomes more lax with the laxity. And if you look at different compartments of the skin, uh, you can see, I won't go over all these, but in the epidermis, for example, um, the keratinocytes de de demonstrate slower turnover. Uh, the melanocytes decrease in number and make less melanin, and it's much more uneven. Uh, in the dermis, as I mentioned, the fibroblasts are slowed, slowed down, and Collagen and elastin and the matrix indeed are all affected. In the subcutaneous fat, there's loss and thinning. There's weakening and retaining ligaments and fewer blood vessels. So aging, again, it takes place in different rates of different people, but it, the character changes are relatively characteristic. And here we have our famous actor Meryl Streep when she was 27 years old, and then now when she's 72 years old, and I think still looks great. Um, and you can see where there's volumetric changes in the distribution of inter by interfacial contours have changed. Um, and that's all things um, that, that we would expect, but her skin quality looks great. The lines that she have are typically more of an animation and those can be helped a little bit, or maybe she doesn't want to. Uh, but uh, this is a, it's an example of what you can see as you're aging. And it again, depends on, on many factors. As I mentioned in the collagen, we call it in the dermis, you get the collagen factory going on here. And the ground substance, um, it's all stuff in between the hyaluronic acid and the glycosaminoglycans all decrease in volume. And the fibroblasts, which you can see in arrows here, some of them just become senescent um, and, and they become inactive and they stop producing collagen and elastin. And uh, that, uh, that causes a reduction in volume as well as tone and uh, texture of the skin. So how can we restart that? Well, we'll talk about a lot of different ways to do that using uh, different procedures. Um, but principally, we're trying to heat the collagen and it denatures and renatures in a tighter process and you get new collagen stimulation and even the fibroblasts become activated and start to produce more collagen. So um, this can occur by many different means and a lot of different devices from lasers to ultrasound-based devices, and we can talk about some of these in the context of aging. Elastin is a little different story. That is those purple wavy fibers you see on the right in the reticular dermis. Um, and those are gonna be a big story, I think, for, for several years to come, because we start losing it, um, you know, even in the teens. And you can see on the graph that, that elastin, it goes down very quickly. Um, and over the course of uh, 15, 20, 30, 40 uh, different decades, it, um, it, it becomes a, basically a, a very uh, depleted substance in the dermis and resulting in uh, skin laxity and wrinkles that stay and don't improve over time. Uh, yeah. And uh, changes to the skin that it's hard to quantify in terms of uh, which you can see visually, but when you can touch your skin and pull on your skin, you can see that it just doesn't have the snap that it used to. 
there's some really good articles if you're interested in reading how these changes are affected by photo aging or from UV exposure. And this is another topic, but this is a classic paper that you can look at. It was in the JAD many, many years ago. And a lot of these, uh, these principles still hold true because we're still getting exposure to the sun. And it's one reason why we're so insistent that our patients have good skin care and sun protection, because no matter what we do to them, the photo aging process is still gonna continue with their bad habits if they have those. And again, by decade, which is our theme in the talk from 20s to 30s to 40s, you see changes in the dermis, you see the accumulation of solar elastosis, you see elastic fibers and collagen breaking down, and all these things are a result in that aged appearance that we see. Many, many molecular changes that I won't go over, but just know this is a complicated process through uh, formation, you know, these extrinsic factors, so not just UV, but um, irradiation um, from infrared, so, heat, so infrared rays, smoking, any of these things. Uh, pollution can even cause this, and the formation of, uh, of free radicals, uh, super, such as superoxide dismutase, and these different, these different compounds really accelerate the aging process uh, through inflammatory means and, and other methods. So the result down at the bottom, again, you can see collagen metabolism is effective and collagen disorganization destruction as well. And there are certain subtypes of people we're beginning to recognize that can look older or younger for their age, depending on, uh, on, uh, on genetic profiles. And here you can see certain expression of protein CDK, CDKN2A expression, um, expression that's lower or higher in certain subgroups of people can affect how they age. And so as we identify these more, uh, we can start to see even why now um, that people look different, even though people have not necessarily paid too much attention to their sun exposure, yet they still have the benefits of youthful skin. And once we identify these, I think it's going to come a long way to how are we going to help uh, people that need it even more uh, early on in life. So skin care is important. This is actually a pretty good Instagram to follow. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest here, but uh, she, she talks a lot about the basics of skin care, the skin masterclass, and it's really good. And you can see in the 20s, 30s, uh, excuse me, 30s, 40s, and 50s, we've already talked about cell rates turning down, proteins breaking down, um, and uh, hyaluronic acid decreasing. And there's certain things you can do based on the decade. For example, she likes alpha hydroxy uh, serums a couple times a week to accelerate um, uh, uh, healthy wound turnover. Uh, of course, broad spectrum um, and high SPF sunscreens, antioxidants, vitamin C is a big one. Um, and then retinoic acid or retinol, because we want to rebuild uh, the, uh, the collagen uh, destruction and retinoic acid. Tretinoic acid, tretinoin, as you know, it is a really could be a really big part of that if you start early and use it throughout your life. In the 40s, you add on to that volume and last the volume change, which occurs with, over time. And then we'll get things, we'll talk about fat compartments and fat, uh, fat loss in the face. Uh, you get more pronounced wrinkling and aging because it's all cumulative. And so we worry about that. And there's other things you can do uh, topically. Uh, which will be talked about in this meeting, um, such as peptide-based uh, uh, topical treatments, um, other moisturizers, and uh, melanin-affecting topicals, which can improve the hyperpigmentation, um, lentigenous and otherwise. And then in the 50s, we, we see that um, the uh, uh, estrogen is changing, and that and the hormone, hormone uh, changes definitely alter the skin by causing even more drying, affecting retaining ligaments, causing more laxity and sagging, especially in certain areas around the jaws and the eyelids. And uh, you have to get a little bit more aggressive with your uh, skin care, but also you know, in the forties and fifties, you, you wanna start thinking about device treatments uh, to improve this process. So how is aging perceived? Why is this such a big deal? Well, all things being equal, let's say, if you're going for a job or if you're looking for uh, the attention of another, uh, having youthful appearance is obviously uh, uh, gonna give you an advantage. So aging is perceived um, is minimizing is more important 
uh, over the course of your life and career. So the ASDS, the American Society of Dermatic Surgery, has been looking at this, um, and they do an annual survey every year, and it gets bigger and bigger. So this is from a couple of years ago, but uh, pandemic sort of slowed this down. But it's really good data that's freely available. Uh, and they said consumers, you know, are most bothered by what in these particular questions? Well, excess weight on the body, of course, skin texture and discoloration, which is aging, lines and wrinkles around the eyes, which is aging due to movement. Uh, they're least bothered by hair loss, acne scarring, and seborrheic keratosis. So what they're saying is photo aging bothers, uh, bothers consumers more. And then what kind of procedures are, are our patients considering? Well, a lot of these light laser radiofrequency treatments for skin tightening and wrinkles, which we just talked about aging being, a, photo aging being a big part of, and then other procedures. But we, we can see here that aging is, reversing aging is, is, is top on the consumer's minds. And then how do you do that with non-invasive uh, uh, methods such as wrinkle relaxers, neurotoxins, and fillers? There's still gonna be a lot of talks on these uh, options in the, in the meeting. So I won't belabor those except as to where you might use them. And then other treatments, chemical peels and we light and laser therapy. So all of these uh, procedures were shown in these surveys to be really highly effective in terms of satisfaction for patients. So this, uh, this is a slide, uh, reflation is better than deflation. You know, we're in, right now we're in inflation, right? That's <laughs> what we're going on here. Uh, in our economy, but you can see just getting older, you can lose quite a bit of volume and you really have to do it uh, annually just to keep up with what you're losing, not necessarily to have more than you're going to have when you start with. Different technologies we'll talk about. Pulse light is a big one in our practice, pulse dye laser, picosecond toning is a new one, radio frequency with needling, ablative resurfacing, ablative fractional and traditional resurfacing are all really valid and validated technologies for using in your practice. And simpler ones, microneedling on the top of the list, routine treatment with microneedling can make a big difference if you, if you start, especially if you start early enough. So what do we mean by IPL? This is pulse light, a device is firing, the light gets emitted and it preferentially gets, heats up the blood vessels in the brown and takes them away. And also it does something that you don't see. These are all um, genes that are induced by the in, during the aging process from ultraviolet light in different parts uh, of, this, of the cells and of the, of the, uh, the dermal matrix of the skin. And these are all genes that uh, there's some overlap that are rejuvenated or these genes are turned back on um, after say that broadband light treatment. So there is a genetic at the molecular level, there is a, and this was a good study that uh, was published in the JID in 2013. So it's, it's several years old, but still a very valid study, uh, looking at uh, how that broadband light you just saw can actually turn on genes and cause anti-aging in that way with rejuvenating functions. And a simple treatment with pulse light and maybe a little bit of light microneedling can give you a vast improvement, as you can see in this patient and really reduces that aged, photo-aged process. Other devices that you may know about, radio frequency microneedling has been very popular over the past uh, couple of years, and especially in, say in comparison with regular microneedling, and there's some good studies, and these all can release growth factors during their treatments that can stimulate collagen and elastic fibers and capillary, refor uh, capillary formation and lead to tissue remodeling. So even some of these simpler procedures can make a difference if you can repeat them on a regular basis. So in our microneedling, you have the same blood vessels and brown spots, but here it's not specific necessarily. The needles go in or in, micro in the case of microneedling, it's just the needles themselves. In the case of RF microneedling, it's the needles plus heat, electrical energy. And these can go in and penetrate and improve um, collagen through all those mechanisms we talked about. How deep do you go? Well, you can see on the left here some of the more common microneedling pen, pins and what they're capable of going to. I mean, I think 2.5 or 3 millimeters is pretty deep. And especially if you're adding energy with some of these other devices, the RF devices are capable of going up to 3.5 millimeters. And uh, so you can get pretty full thickness of the dermis impact with some of these devices. Here they're going in. They're not really you know, damaging or, or attracted to the pigment per se, they're just breaking up things and causing collagen 
remodeling through heat. And again, these RF microneedling, in contrast to what you just saw, are going to go in and they're going to heat up at a, at a given depth. And with that heat, they cause even more stimulation of collagen and wound healing uh, through heating mechanisms. So all things being equal, if you can add a little heat to your treatments uh, or a little thermal injury uh, in a controlled fashion, you can get even more improvement than you would get with, say, conventional microneedling. One thing to keep in mind is the thickness of the skin really varies depending on where you are. So all those numbers about going to 1.5 or 2 or 2.5 or 3.5, it really depends on where you are. So just know your depths. Uh, for example, on the eyelids, it's, it's pointless to go really deeper than 1.5. I, I usually stay pretty shallow in the eyelids, and that makes sense. Um, whereas if you're on the malar cheeks or in different areas, you might want to consider lateral cheeks going to 2.5 or 3 three millimeters to get even more penetration, in, and especially in the case of RF microneedling. So this is an example of that, where this, this is going in, this needle is going at a different angle in, and uh, you can see it going all the way up to two millimeters, and there's a thermal heating zone there, um, which corresponds with this particular laser, this particular RF device, giving a thermal profile, which will heat at that depth and a little bit below, a little bit beyond. So the aging process on the surface, we can see it. Below though, we, there's a lot of things going on in the fat and the muscle and the bone. The bone is resorbing, especially in the uh, periocular area in the, uh, the orbital rim and then also in the um, pre-jowl sulcus, whereas the fat, especially in the mid cheek is descending and causing changes that we think about characteristic with aging. So all these changes over uh, contribute to an overall facial aged appearance. And they all can have effects on one another. So here you can see again, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, the different decades. And as the volume gets lost, uh, we start to develop these um, not only lines from, uh, uh, from animation, but also lines just from the loss of volume and uh, laxity. So you've got, you really got to identify what lines you're looking at uh, when patients are worried about wrinkling whether it's dynamic or static, whether it's caused by volume loss, whether it's caused by muscle movement. And you can get a pretty good gauge of that sort of based on their decade um, and go from there. I mentioned fat redistribution, again, going to the decades, age 35, 45, and 55. You see how the yellow um, fat uh, the compartments are starting to recede and shrink, and that results in overlying changes on the face. So some of the more common areas you see around the eyes, uh, and uh, the mid cheeks, as you can see, and 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 these even this even can become even more complicated because there's superficial and deep fat compartments, and so knowing what you're targeting, for example, with fillers, uh, will make a big difference if you can target in the right fat compartment. I mentioned bone resorption. Here's an image. If you see the black dots, fine black dots around the orbital rim uh, and, and the uh, superorbital notch, superorbital, superorbital frame, and, and then the, uh, the uh, chin area and the, uh, 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 the pre-jowl sulcus, all those dots are where the bone resorption is the most, and this has been out of MRI study data. This is another interesting study from several years ago, just showing that the invert, how these fat pads will come inverse in areas like, such as the temple over age, you know, over the decades, and you get an increase in the in fat pads in the bottom as opposed to the top um, from descent, and that changes the aged appearance and causes hollows. And I mentioned the orbital retaining ligaments. These yellow areas and black lines represent these orbital retaining ligaments that help to keep uh, laxity to minimum, and they start to get lost over time in terms of the tension. And some of this is hormone related, and some of it's just generalized aging and um, laxity, and you can see that these retaining ligaments are important because they anchor all the way up into the dermis for the periosteum. So when you start to lose integrity, the dermis in certain areas will start to uh, will start to uh, la become lax and, and uh, overlap over other uh, neighboring areas. For example, in this periorbital area here, with the zygomatic cutaneous re retaining ligaments, and then you get these characteristic changes in surface anatomy that we all 
know about with from fillers such as tear trough, the temple, the mailer bag, marionette lines, jowling. All this is a result of what's going on from the aging process below. So I mentioned that going back to the anti-aging technologies, pulse light, microneedling, RF microneedling we've talked about, pick a second lasers, focused ultrasound are all options um, for treatment. And of course, when you look at some of the more, some of the more aggressive options for uh, Called improving laxity and texture. You can talk about ablative lasers, CO2 or erbium YAG, and that could be either the fractional ones, which are really popular in traditional uh, lasers, which are non-fractional, more confluent, and those can have a dramatic effect. What we have to think about is where are we really targeting? So with, when you see these wrinkles, it's really important to understand the dynamic wrinkles, which we know about, can treat with neurotoxins. But the other wrinkles, we have lines, wrinkles, and folds. And where the folds are deeper, so you think about it as being a deeper defect in the dermis. And so when you're targeting these with energy-based devices and lasers, you want to get your collagen simulation in those areas. So treating with a more superficial area in the nature of a fold is really not going to help you all that much. It needs more volume. So consider adding fillers plus energy-based device. Um, if you've got a really deep crease, consider doing some subcision and breaking up that dermal tethering and then maybe adding an energy-based device because you really need to get down to the depth of the wrinkle you're talking about. I always use this analogy with my patients with the table and the tablecloth. Uh, and the tablecloth, uh, the table is the underlying facial structure. It's kind of hard to treat because um, we can't really change the bone with devices. Maybe, yeah, maybe in the future. Uh, you want to consider deep, deep dermal fillers on the bone, periosteal placement to improve that contour. But even the best tablecloth won't spread without the proper table. So you can resurface and you can do all kinds of things. And without the table, uh, it's still going to look um, volume depleted. Whereas on the other side here, the superficial skin structure, the table can look great. But if your tablecloth is aged and wrinkly, um, it's, it's still going to look uh, inappropriate for uh, or, or aged appearance for what you want. And in those cases, you would target them with uh, devices. I think it's easier to target the superficial skin, obviously, with the device to make it look better. But you have to keep in mind that revolumization is also important. There's just some examples of targeting the table cloth. Here you can see dynamic wrinkling that can be improved with toxins, but also around the mouth. Laser resurfacing can help with those deep etched in lines. This is a close-up view. Same here. These are what I would consider still mild lines and mild elastosis. So a combination of toxin and resurfacing make a big difference. Now we go back through these options again. Um, and for deeper, uh, for deeper contour, deeper lines here that are also caused by animation, but these cheek lines are also caused are volume loss uh, related. So you can you can you can't really treat with toxin in these areas. You can affect a lot of structures. And so what do you do with these areas? Well, revolumizing with um, biostimulatory fillers has become something that's a really good option to do nowadays. But these RF microneedling devices can really do a good job as well at building collagen in these areas. You can see in the mid face here, we've got some improvement in the jowl and neck uh, laxity just with one RF microneedling device treatment. Same here, a little bit more. Uh, advanced case, and again, RF microneedling treatment times one, you get a really nice improvement in the jawline. And you can still use fillers and things like this for the tear trough area and toxins um, on the forehead, but uh, these areas don't respond as well to fillers as they would to devices, in this case, RF microneedling. So this was a patient with acne scarring who had, um, you can see the wrinkling, she has laxity from aging plus acne scarring, which is a contour defect in the dermis. And here we just, uh, you know, we simply did some RF microneedling and uh, we were able to get a really nice volumetric improvement in this and it improved the aged appearance as well as the acne scarring. And so finally we get to the sort of the pentultimate treatment, which would be uh, fractional ablative resurfacing. And here you can see elastosis and photoaging and all those processes we talked about combined on the face to cause an aged appearance. And after a re fully ablative resurfacing and some good skin care and maintenance with toxin, uh, you get a really nice improvement in the texture. And this can be long, long lasting for many, many years. And indeed, you can take a decade of 
the appearance off of somebody with a treatment such as this. And here's the other side. I mean, a lot of times the damage is not equal. So on the sun, on the sun, uh, the driver side, it might be more photo aged and you can sort of see here how the improvement in the lines and elastosis, which is hard to get. And so this is a pretty aggressive treatment to get this kind of result. But even with this result, you still want to have um, to prevent the aging process from marching on. So maintenance with neurotoxin, maintenance with fillers every year are gonna go a long way to maintaining this result. I just wanna thank you for your time and uh, attention and I'm happy to answer any questions at the meeting. You can come up to me anytime or during the talk after the talk itself. Thank you.